now we're going to go over to, um, well, we're heading over to California now, actually, because we're oh. going to go and speak to the senior astronomer and institute fellow at the SETI Institute, Seth Shostak. Uh, how's uh, lockdown treating you, Seth? Well, the lockdown is is not doing much, but, uh, you know, I'm going slightly stir crazy. But I think the people who know me best would say that's no change in my situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, what to ask the first question, is that a real background or is that a, a, a fake Zoom background you've got there? Because that's oh, really no, 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 no. This is the real deal. Wow. Oh, wow. What are we ah. looking yeah, at? I mean, it, it's just my den. There's nothing special about it. I don't know. I see something with a cog or a wheel in the background. Like yeah, I think you're all, you're all too young to remember film. No. But, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's a scanner. I am. <laughs> that's a scanner. I'm using it to change, uh, sorry, to transfer some 16 millimeter films that I've made, including the Invisible Universe, by the way, wow. uh, wow. onto digital format so I can see them without setting up the projector. <laughs> Fantastic. So, what what is new and big in the world of SETI right now? Where are we at? Well, SETI, obviously, all the practitioners, which uh, the total number of which is not terribly much greater than the number of people on your screen right now, uh, you know, obviously they can't go to work, but they can still use the instruments hmm. because the instruments can be operated remotely. So uh, so that's going on. That's radio SETI where we're trying to you know pick up signals that some. Klingons have deigned to broadcast into space, uh, at least partially in our direction. But the other things that are going on, we're going to be doing some experiments using the VLA in New Mexico. That's very large array. And of course, uh, you know, at the moment, SETI is just an American enterprise. In fact, I would say it's just a, you know, a Californian enterprise. And in fact, more than that, it's just a Northern California enterprise within 50 miles of where I'm sitting. I'm in the Silicon Valley, <laughs> but 50 miles away is Berkeley, California. Some of you may have heard of it and uh, Berkeley, I guess, <laughs> the UK. And it's, uh, <laughs> and, and they have a, the big Breakthrough Listen project. So it's a very, very uh, tiny enterprise. And that's a problem. That's a problem because uh, and it's all governed by money. But look, what's what's happening? I mean, I think the most interesting things are the discovery of exoplanets. But if you actually look within the SETI community itself, uh, it's the matter of having better equipment, uh, speeding up the search by basically applying more computer power to it, including machine learning and things like that. So oh, we've had a, a question from a listener, uh, Rachel Tumbles, um, and he said, uh, could you discuss what happens when we discover possible habitable planets? What what is what happens at SETI? What what do you get excited about? What do you do when we we found something that looks habitable? Well, it depends on when you when you when the answer is given. If we're back in the fall of 1995, when we found you know 51 Peg or the, the people actually uh, down the street. Well, no, actually it was the two Swiss astronomers who found it. By the way, that's an interesting question, why it was found by Swiss astronomers. When you look at astronomy around the world, you know, who does the most astronomy research? It's all the formerly seafaring or currently seafaring countries, mm -hmm. right? Because astronomy used to be useful. I don't want to say it's not useful today, but you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, so they all set observatories because set up observatories because they needed the, you know, they, they needed the time, right? I mean, uh, you know, it was it was a matter of navigation. So the countries today that are big in astronomy research tend to be countries that had navies that, you know, or uh, in the case of the Dutch, didn't have a navy, but they had a lot of merchant ships and so forth and so on. So, uh, you know, it was kind of a mystery to me why the, it was that the Swiss found the first exoplanet because, you know, Switzerland doesn't have a whole lot of coastline. And, <laughs> uh, and, and I asked uh, that one of the guys who found it, Michel Mayor, one of the guys who found this first 51 peg, the first exoplanet around a normal star. And he said it was because they had this uh, watch industry. Mm -hmm. Very expensive watches come out of Switzerland and the watch companies wanted to know the time very accurately so they could calibrate their watches. So they set up observatories. Anyhow, that's kind of a side point and I that's won't go more. That's a great side point. But, but it's a great that. point, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well, it, the, the story goes on for another hour and a half, but... Uh, we're, we're, we're good, keep going. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, so when the exoplanets were first being discovered, you know, oh, there's every, every two weeks there was another one. Of course, we swung our antennas in the direction 
of these star system thinking, that's it, Bob, right over there, that's where the aliens will be. But what has happened uh, in the past, you know, two, three years now, is that we have enough data to say that essentially all stars have planets. Maybe it's 80%, maybe it's 90%, but 80% in astronomy is the same as all, right? So- uh, Yeah, uh, as an astronomer can confirm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you, get, if you get anything right within a factor two, that's really high precision. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> that wouldn't work for all endeavors like paying your taxes, for example. But that, that's- But when the universe is so big, right? A factor is you know, you, probably uh, fine. Uh, Maybe you think it's big. I don't know. Compared to anybody else's universe, is it really big? I don't know. But <laughs> in, in, in any case, <laughs> we would get excited about these exoplanets in the early days. But once we figured out that, well, point at any star. I mean, not a you know, not an early type star, not a you know, a big blue O type star. They don't live very long, so no chance for Klingons to evolve on a planet around there. But if you point at any star, you know, even slightly larger to the uh, than the sun all the way down to M dwarfs, the chances are it's got planets, whether you found them or not. So there's no point in getting excited to finally address the question of the, uh, the, the listener or viewer who might have expired from old age by now, to finally address that question. We don't get all that excited about new exoplanet discoveries. Oh, this might be an Earth-like planet. I mean, there was one in the news this week because there are just so many of them out there. We might as well just point at the nearest star systems. Just old hat now finding a new exoplanet. Yeah, it's, I, it's like looking for ants. You know, <laughs> when you only know about one ant colony, you get really excited about that. But once you figure out that ants are everywhere, you just go to the nearest backyard, right? Uh, yeah, it's true. It's, I mean, back when extra galactic astronomy was really getting going, you know, people would find a, you know, new, slightly more distant galaxy and be like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And, and now, like, we just know about so many, it's only really going to be the first galaxies that we've talked about a little bit today that are, that are really going to, you know, get people going and really be excited. I mean, people used to do whole papers about finding a galaxy. It doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, it's like, you know, it was a big story, I guess, when the first lottery winner showed up in California. But there have been so many now, nobody cares. I mean, I don't know. That's not a very good analogy, but you know what I mean. I, is there a reason that Paul is totally frozen? Is it cold where he is? <laughs> it's England. It's always cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, well, well, I'm going to assume that, that Paul's frozen and, and, can't, uh, and can't continue. So what, what we want to ask a question from a, another listener. Um, in fact, a question that we've been asking to to all of the, the people that have been joining us, all of our guests, and that's um, the Square Kilometer Array and James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, which is going to generate the most exciting science in your view? And if each one could answer just one question about the universe, what would you like it to be? And I think we can probably guess. <laughs> you, you can. And since everybody else who's addressed this question was named Chris, I find myself... Uh, unworthy of adding to what they have said. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm, I'm, Chris, I'm, can do. I'm a radio astronomer, so it's just like you guys, except, you know, the wavelength's a little longer. But I, so naturally, I'm going to favor the SKA, the square kilometer ray. It's about 10 times the area of, uh, you know, other things. But it's only about 10 times. Now, 10 times would mean you're looking at uh, maybe 30 times as much space at any given sensitivity. So that's a big deal. And it would be great if the SKA, which can be used for SETI, you know, were to pick up a signal. I think Chris North already suggested that. Maybe Chris Lintod also. I think he did as well. But, you know, it, it's going to do astronomy of stuff that's small because it has its, its big advantage, other than covering up a lot of European real estate, which is always a good idea. I mean, it's, its big advantage is that because it's an array, right, it can see fine detail. And so you're going to learn a lot about things like radio galaxies and so forth, just by being able to make, if you will, better radio pictures. A, a terrific example of this was this, you know, black hole photo. That was a radio telescope photo, of course, but it was a virtual telescope. It was a bunch of antennas spread around the world. So it's sort of like an SKA, except it's, you know, many tens of thousands of kilometers uh, across, but that gives it the high resolution to see these details. So I, I think the SKA is going to be pretty nifty. And because you can siphon off some of the uh, data stream there and use it for SETI, you know, SETI is sort of running on alongside that, just like 
just like an experiment on the Large Hadron Collider. You know, you've got your own experiment and you just take part of that beam of collided particles over to where you are and you do your own work. So there's that. But it has to be said that when people ask, and they occasionally do, along with all the embarrassing questions that people ask me, like, you know, are the aliens really going to land in uh, Swindon and, you know, destroy everything? Uh, That's a good idea, question. by the way. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I live near Swindon. That's not a bad plan. <laughs> I, I've heard that said by various people from the UK, but, you know, of course they're wrong, because when you think of how the UK is viewed from outside the boundaries, uh, you know, the only places they've ever heard of are Swindon and Clapham Junction, and that's pretty much it. So in any case, <laughs> and, and, and I, where was I? What was I talking about? I don't even know. Uh, oh, yes. the <laughs> When people ask, how are we going to find life in space first, right? Uh, you know, there's this kind of a debate about that. Because on the one hand, you could say, okay, it's going to be a square kilometer array, or all the radio telescopes that are looking now, we're just going to pick up a signal. Now we know there's somebody out there at least as clever as the inhabitants of Earth. That would be, you know, that probably make it to the papers, right? At least the <laughs> tabloids. So that's a good thing. But on the other hand, maybe the first life we find is with the James Webb telescope when we see oxygen in the atmosphere of some planet where we don't even see the planet but we had get you know one pixel's worth of light coming from it, put that through a spectroscope and see the lines of oxygen. And that might be the fastest way to find life. The other way to find it is to find it in our own solar system for which you need neither of those telescopes. <laughs> what, what would be your prediction as the one we find first? Well, as I say, people do ask me that and then I launch into an answer and they walk away quietly. Uh, I. <laughs> I, you know, I, I like to bet on SETI, and in fact, I, I gave a talk, I don't know, what is it, like eight or nine years ago in Germany, in which I said, I'll bet every, you, every one of you guys a cup, of, a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee that will find ET within 20 years. And I still stand by that. Uh, my wife is buying a lot of uh, Starbucks stock, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that may happen, but... You know, uh, the NASA's chief scientist three years ago uh, said, well, we're going to find life within 20 years. And she meant by finding it in our solar system, mm. you know, microbial life. So microbial life is great. It's biology after all, but it doesn't talk back to you. So uh, I'm, I'm still looking for intelligent life. And I think we're going to find it before all you people go uh, on pension. Cool. Excellent. That's I'm a liking that. That's yeah. perfect place to I face. like the commitment. Yes. <laughs> Which is not something we always get. Sometimes people are a bit wishy-washy, and I just love that you're like, sati, well, straight in. Yes, people have said I should be committed. <laughs> 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 We've actually asked a comment in um, the chat saying that, um, this is from Averted Vision, um, saying, hi, Seth, your bookcase looks exactly like Commander Hills. And actually, they do. <laughs> like your well, backgrounds, I don't, I don't to, yours and Paul's backgrounds. Yeah. That that was that was painted by my children earlier today. The that Union Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They painted that. Did they actually? They did. It's they literally. Very they, good. they were actually. They, how was this for a weird story? They were entering a competition online at the Tank Museum um, for to win something, and they needed a Union flag in the picture. But, but Paul, it's not that impressive. They are forty. <laughs> <laughs> They'd leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks yeah. very, very much, Seth. That's been wonderful speaking to you. Where can people uh, hear more from you? And in particular, where can Mike, one of the panellists who asks um, about hearing that hour and a half on astronomy for navies, where can he hear about that? Astronomy for, sorry? For navies. Um, the navies. So astronomy navies. for navies. <laughs> The Navy doesn't care about it much, uh, care much about astronomy anymore. Although, you know, I, uh, I grew up in the Washington DC area and I frequently would go to the US Naval Observatory, which was set up to keep time, of course, but they do other things as well. Uh, you know, just have them go to SETI.org. That's where they ought to go. Yeah. Wonderful. Lovely to speak to you, Seth. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.